This is Extra Paycheck Podcast, episode number 60. You're listening to Extra Paycheck Podcast, where you will learn how to build and grow your own successful online business. Now, here's your host, Alex Soul. Welcome to yet another episode of Extra Paycheck Podcast. This is episode number 60, and this week I've got a very special guest for you. His name is Christopher Gimmer, and he is the co-founder of Snappa.io, easiest graphic design tool you will ever find. And anybody could use the tool, even if you don't have any kind of graphic design skills whatsoever. Really great episode ahead of you, so enjoy today's show. Hi, Christopher, and welcome to the Extra Paycheck Podcast. Thanks for having me. Christopher, please tell us a little bit more about yourself, your background, and what is that you do as a business? Uh, So uh, currently I'm working on a startup called uh, Snappa, and it's basically uh, a very easy to use graphic design tool. Um, And so going back, I guess, to my background, um, I actually went to school for business. I got a Bachelor of Commerce, uh, and then I had dreams of being a Wall Street brat at the time. Um, And I graduated uh, just after the 2008 recession. Uh, so that uh, th- that put a damper on my dreams a little bit, um, and then I actually started working in the government in more of an accounting role, uh, and I did that for about, uh, I guess it would have been like five years, and so at, towards the end of it, I just couldn't see myself, um, you know, pushing papers in a cubicle for the rest of my life, um, and that's when I really started to, you know, think about how I could uh, start an online business and do something that I was a little bit more passionate about and have a bit more freedom in my life. Mm -hmm. Well, the first question that comes to mind, why did you think of starting an online business as opposed to a regular brick and mortar? Um, I think most of it had to do with the fact that, I I guess to me, an online business just seemed easier to start. Um, just in terms of like capital requirements, I mean, like if you're talking a brick and mortar business, um, you know, most of them you're, you're going to need inventory. Uh, you might need to rent out a a spot. Um, and I was just very fascinated by the whole online thing. The, just being able to work from anywhere, um, was pretty fascinating to me. You know, in brick and mortars, you can definitely build up your business to the point where you can kind of delegate everything and you, you can kind of work on it from everywhere. But I think when you're starting a brick and mortar business, it, it would be really hard to kind of work from anywhere as you're building it up. Uh, whereas mm-hmm. an online business, I think, you know, you really can work from anywhere as, as you're building it up. So to me, mm-hmm. it just seemed um, easier to start, I guess, less capital uh, requirements. It, it was something that I can do on the side while I was still working uh, because I, I didn't leave my job until we were making enough money that, that I could afford to do that. Uh, so that that was kind of my thought process at the time. Mm-hmm. This is a great one. And I think that's you know a similar reason for, for a lot of us, people who work online, uh, mostly is the fact that you don't need a huge capital to get started. In fact, you could... You could start for free, totally free. If you're not completely broke, you could get started online. Although I would suggest having at least a few hundred dollars so you could, you know, buy a proper domain name and hosting, uh, the very basics. But yeah, as opposed to spending, you know, 20, 50, 100, $200,000 on setting up a physical shop, that's a huge difference. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, the price of or the cost of starting an online business just keeps getting cheaper and cheaper every year like hosting is is just dirt cheap a domain is basically you know 10 bucks or less um you know all the software that you need to run a business just keeps getting cheaper so Mm -hmm. yeah totally and uh so the second question from your introduction Snappa, why did you start that specific business? So um, the business that we were working on before Snappa, which uh, we still own, uh, but we're not really actively working on it, um, it's Bootstrap Bay. It's a marketplace for uh, themes and templates. And so I was uh, doing all the content marketing. I was uh, writing a lot of blog posts. Um, and obviously, when you're writing blog posts, you need to create images. 
Uh, I'm not a designer. I wasn't really good in Photoshop. I knew kind of the bare minimum. Uh, and my, my co-founder, who is really good at design, you know, he was too busy working on the actual development and the website. So the last thing I wanted to do was bother him with, uh, you know, graphics for the blog. And so I just wished at the, you know, that there was a, a, an easier tool for people like me um, that don't that don't really consider themselves designers, um, you know, and, and give give us the power uh, to be able to create these images themselves rather than um, having to master a complicated tool like Photoshop or um, ha having to hire a designer when you don't have the budget to do that. And so when I looked at, you know, what was on the market at the time, uh, you know, there's nothing really that, I mean, there was stuff, there's stuff out there for sure. Um, but there were just things that I wish they would do differently. And, and that's kind of what uh, we set out to build. Mm -hmm. that, that makes a lot of sense. And this is something that, uh, oh my God, so needed by, as you mentioned, a lot of online businesses. And this is a huge mistake that a lot of beginners make. They would grab pictures just from anywhere online, right? And use it for their blog posts and for their websites. And often you would ask those people like, well, where did you get this picture? Like, oh, don't worry, I got it from Google, so it's free. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, like, uh, I, I've heard many stories of, um, the, the, the worst thing is that I, I've, I've heard stories where people will own a blog and they'll have uh, people guest posting for them. Mm -hmm. And, the people who are guest posting will grab images off Google, and then a few months later, the owner of that blog will get uh, a letter in the mail with uh, pay us, you know, five thousand dollars, or we'll, or it'll we'll take you to court. Um, so yeah, totally, you have to be definitely have to be careful with with where you're sourcing your images from. Yeah, and to elaborate on that a little bit more, uh, for people, let's say if you go on Flickr. Uh, it, it's called Flickr, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm, yeah. If you go on Flickr, you could sort images by um, seeing images that are free to use, like copyright free images. The problem with this, uh, with Flickr, let's say, is that pretty much anyone can sign up on Flickr for free and upload whatever images they want on there and claim that they're copyright free. So someone could steal images from known photographers, upload them and claim that they're copyright free. Now you're going to do your research. So you're like, okay, you know, I'm going to get a copyright free image and use that. I'll take it from Flickr. And that's, you know, another problem because you think it's a copyright free image, but it's not really, it never was. It's just someone who uploaded there for whatever reason. And you're going to get screwed once again, uh, you know, being sued for as you said, five thousand dollars. I've heard a lot of companies like Getty Images. I think their uh, starting rate is about eight thousand dollars. That's what they charge you for using one of their images without, you know, first buying it from them. Uh, so yeah, this is something that a lot of people don't think about it, don't know about. But this is super, super important, and you have to be really careful with the images that you're using. And you know, it would be much better if you actually make your own images. Then you're really safe. Yeah, definitely. And and th there's a few sites now where, um, you know, they're, they're releasing images under Creative Commons. And what I would uh, advise when, um, you know, when doing so is, uh, you know, making sure that it's a reputable site um, that actually kind of vets the photographers or there's um, Creative Commons sites where it's run by like one person and he's a photographer. And so you know that, you know, that guy isn't going to put his reputation and his his entire brand on the line by uploading false photos. So, you, so in that case, you can kind of be a little more assured that they're legit. Um, but, you know, if to, to, to go to Google or Flickr, uh, that, that's where you definitely run into trouble. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. And I've used some websites like, uh, what are they called? Death, Death to Stock? Yeah, yeah photo and unsplash i think as well yeah. so yeah if you if you go to sites like that then then you should be fine um so mm -hmm. and which site are you guys using for uh for for grabbing some photos to incorporate in your graphics so we we run a, a site in parallel with snappa called a uh, stock snap and basically what we do is uh we source and have submissions through these, you know, photographers who are releasing their photos uh, under Creative Commons, 
Um, so essentially, it's basically sourced from um, a few places around the web with uh, trusted photographers that are that are releasing their photos. Mm -hmm. Really mm -hmm. awesome. And uh, StockSnap works on itself? Uh, what do you mean by I'm, that? I'm, Sorry. I'm, I mean, it's a standalone from, from Snap, right? It's a standalone website. I could just go to StockSnap and grab some pictures from there. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's standalone. Mm -hmm. But also pictures available there they are uh, available through snap if i understand correctly that's correct so all so the entire uh library of photos on stock snap is uh is integrated within snappa and so that's one of the huge advantages of uh of our program is that um you don't have to go to all these different sites um to to download images and then import them into photoshop or whatever other tool you're using um we have a database of over 10,000 stock photos directly uh within our platform that you can use uh to to get started so it's extremely efficient mm -hmm. <laughs> that is really awesome and that's that's like a big time saver as well <laughs> at the same time yeah definitely i mean one of the like the like our or alpha version, I would call it, um, you know, the, the biggest fee or a lot of the feedback that we got was just that feature alone of having, you know, that huge library. And these are, I mean, if you've seen these, the photo, these photos are, they're beautiful photos are not cheesy, you know, crappy stock photos that, that you can buy that e even, even paying for, for some of these, uh, photos, uh, people would. Um, so that was, that was one of the big things was just the time, saved from not having to go to 10 different websites, downloading a photo and uploading it into a program to start editing it. Uh, you know, that's literally a few seconds of, of searching and, and clicking. Mm -hmm. Totally. And uh, Christopher, I wanted to ask you about, I guess, the way the Snapper was built. Do you guys have like a, a developer on board or how did you how did you manage to build the actual platform? So uh, I have a co-founder who's he's a technical co-founder. His, his name's Mark. Uh, so he's the one who built it. Um, there's months and months of months of work that have gone into it so far. Um, so, yeah, I, I can't imagine doing it with a contractor. I think if you're if you're going to be a software company, I think you definitely need to have a technical person as part of the founding team. Um, otherwise, it's, it's going to be very difficult uh, to try to run a software business with, with contractors and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I agree with that. And I've thought about it many times for some ideas that I had for, let's say, apps even. Yeah. And when I would, um, you know, I'm not a developer of, like at all at all this is like so far for me <laughs> but sometimes when i would get an app idea i would start looking online what kind of technology would be used for this kind of app yeah and then i would figure out that pretty much everything or most of uh what needs to be done for this app to exist is like very uh, custom yeah and then i would start looking at people who could custom code it for me and uh, usually I would be like, wow, this is, you know, if I want this app to exist, it would cost me like hundred grand. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. Especially, you know, if it's one of those things where you have an idea and, you know, kind of you build it and then you can just start selling it and it won't, you know, uh, take that much maintenance to, to keep it going, you know, that's fine. You can, you can hire someone to build it for you. But for a, a SaaS product, like a software as a service where, you're charging a monthly fee and you need to keep improving that uh, over a, a long period of time, uh, you, you definitely need someone fully invested uh, in the business for sure. And that's the other mm -hmm. thing. I mean, we obviously, especially a, a SaaS business where, you know, you're charging monthly subscriptions, um, obviously some are annual, but it takes time to really get to the point where you're making, a, uh, you know, a decent amount of money. Um, and so you, you need someone on your team who's who's really motivated and will kind of see it through um, because, you know, if a contractor is going to you're they're going to want to be paid by the hour um, and you're, you're going to have to shell out a lot of money before you can make it back. So, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And for your company, as I was looking, you you have two different memberships. One being a starter, which is free. Yeah. And one being the pro, which is fifteen dollars a month, which is really not a big deal. And that was exactly my question. Like how uh, th- that must be really hard to to start getting paid well enough by you know s- selling a subscription at only fifteen dollars per month. Yeah, it's um, unless you have a very large audience or you're a marketing god, I wouldn't recommend um, you know a, a software business where you have a, a low um, subscription fee. The reason why we've been able to pull it off is because uh, we have Stock Snap, and so we built that site even before Snappa. And that site generates two million page views a month right now. Wow! Um, yeah, so we we have enough traffic where it could work for us. Um, but if we didn't have Stock Snap, it would be extremely difficult to make Snappa work. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And this is actually <laughs> really really smart marketing. I find for something brand new. Um, if you already have an established audience for something else in the same industry or something very similar, that's a great idea to to promote your 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 new business, your new service. Yeah, definitely. Especially, um, you know, marketing takes time. I mean, like our, our last business, um, you know, we built it up pretty much exclusively through content marketing and SEO. Um, but you know, that took three four months to really get going. Um, and Snappa, we're in extremely competitive space when it comes to content. I mean, you know, some of the articles that we're writing, you know, we're going up against all these all these kinds of well-established internet uh, marketing software companies. So uh, it, it's tough, right? So, so yeah, I fully agree that if you can build up your audience beforehand, um, it's definitely the way to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I see that happen again and again, especially with like big name uh, marketers online. And I always found it fascinating. It's like, wow, this guy is so good, you know, and what you guys did really right. And I I think it was kind of natural for you to keep going with the same direction. You know, it was always about, about images and pictures. So you just kept on going with the same team, with the same industry. And that, you know, it helps you market it. It helps you in your specific case, because you had an audience, but I think it also helps you because you already have a lot of ideas and experiences in this specific industry. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, you know, a trend, a trend I've, I've noticed lately uh, with with software products, um, a lot of people, uh, so a perfect example of this is uh, Edgar. I don't know if you've heard, it's a new social media tool. Yeah, I actually had the honor of Edgar uh, on this podcast recently. Oh, you had Laura? <laughs> on the podcast yeah. oh awesome. yes yes uh essentially she had a um a consult well i wouldn't call it consulting but she had an info product business so she taught people social media and then she built up a huge audience through that i think she had something like seventy five thousand subscribers um and she the the method that she taught was basically like you know don't just keep constantly tweeting actually have a a library that you can kind of choose from and then she built a software that essentially did what what she taught in her uh in her program or in her courses and by that time she had a huge email list so um you can imagine how much easier it was for her to to market the software product when she already had this audience she already had these info products um the method she already had the methodology and I think that's a really, really great way to start a business now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. And uh, another great example I'd like to share is uh, Pat Flynn from the Smart Passive Income. He is selling a software called uh, Smart Podcast Player. Okay. That's a plugin that he built for himself yep. because you know he runs a podcast and he couldn't find a player that looks good on WordPress. So he built, he had a team build a player for him and eventually he started selling it because he saw the demand. Yeah. It wasn't the initial goal, right, for the software, but he saw the demand and people were like, oh my God, your player looks so nice. I want a copy, where do I buy it? And eventually he started selling it. But what helped him once again so much is that this guy has a huge following 
and probably hundreds of thousands of people follow him online. So when he launched that podcast player, it was just that much easier to get sales coming in as opposed to, uh, let's say, me starting um, an app that helps you to work out or something, which I'm totally unrelated to this industry, right? But I'm sure that if I did start an app like this or a service, chances are it would fail rather fast. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's that's another great example. And, yeah, it just goes to show that, you know, having an audience is just so beneficial. Uh, um, and I think so, I think software is really hard um, to get into. And so you kind of want to have as, as much of, it, of an advantage as you can bef- before you start. Yeah. Also, a problem with software that I find a lot of people – build software with the sole purpose and the only goal to make money. <laughs> That's probably the worst uh, worst reason for starting in software, I think. Totally. And those are the software that we uh, often don't hear about because they don't get anywhere. They fail fast, like really fast because people feel it, people smell it, you know, it's and it's it's you can't as you just said it's the worst reason to start, especially a software. Yeah, definitely. All right, Christopher, I'd like to go back to uh, your website, uh, StockSnap. Yeah. Uh, so you told me that, well, first of all, the Bootstrap Bay, that's the one that you said you did a lot of content marketing to get it going, right? That's correct. What about the StockSnap? How did you uh, market that? And it, the number is incredible. You said you're getting two million unique visitors per month. Page views. Uh, page yeah, views. You, uh, uniques. Uh, I think it's around like three, four hundred thousand, something like that. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's an incredible number. Like, how do you build a website like this to such high numbers? So, so what was happening at, around that time um, was. So a lot of these photographers were starting uh, to release their photos under Creative Commons. It was it was pretty new at the time, um, and so a lot of these photographers photographers were creating these websites where they would share like you know seven photos every seven days or something like that, um, and and so they got really popular. Um, and so every every few weeks you would see a, a new one come up. Right. The problem was that there was kind of no search functionality and then you had to go to you know 10 or 15 uh, uh different websites so we thought you know a lot of you know everyone's kind of really digging these photos um why don't we just build a site where uh it kind of aggregates all of them and, and you can search them um so and right before this we had created a, a blog post on bootstrap bay on where to get free stock photos um, and that post basically went viral. It was one of the uh, so I had seen a post on Medium where someone was linking out to all these um, websites where they were releasing really nice Creative Commons photos, and it was literally just a list of links. And so what I did was, um, you know, I made the the post a little more lengthy. I added images. I you know wrote what license each uh, each photos were released under. And so when I released that, you know, people, it, it just got shared like crazy. Like there's several hundred thousand shares uh, on that wow. post. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, obviously, you know, that that just told me that there was a huge demand for really nice Creative Commons photography. Um, and so to be honest, when we launched StockSnap, uh, we obviously linked to it within our own blog post. Um, We also posted it on Product Hunt. It got over a thousand upvotes. Um, And from there, people just kept writing about, like every time there was a post about where to get free stock photos, you know, StockSnap always made the list. Um, And we've just grown that way through through people mentioning us. Mm -hmm. That is really awesome. And I really love the um, strategy, I guess, that you just shared with us. This is something that works so well and this is something that uh well i've just tried recently and of course it hasn't worked for me like it did for you because i didn't promote it well and uh but still what i did is i wrote a blog post it's basically a list of 30 books that i think every entrepreneur should read in 2016 so there's you know 
ranking would be really hard because I'm competing with websites like entrepreneur.com and inc.com and business insider uh, because they're taking up all the like top rankings for s- similar keywords mm-hmm. on, on, on Google's uh, top results. Yeah. But uh, most of them, they share a list of like five books or seven books. Yeah. So that was my first thing. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do more than they do, more than any of them do. So I, I decided to do a 30 books because that's pretty much um, the list of books that I figured that I personally read in the past two years, let's say 2014 and 15. Mm-hmm. Another thing that I did to differentiate myself from them, I made um, like really quick description, I guess, maybe like two, three lines, two, three sentences describing each book, what it's about. Mm-hmm. Because some of those books are more like self-motivation and self-improvement books. Yeah. Others are uh, autobiographies from successful people, and you know some of them are in the um, technology industry. Yet some other books, they're real step-by-step like business strategies that you could replicate and apply to your business. So I thought it would be a great idea to give a really good example, a really good description of what each book is about. So someone who scans through my list, they, you know, let's say someone doesn't like self-improvement books, they wouldn't have to figure out that that's what it's about because I tell them right away, this is a self-improvement. So if you don't like this kind of um, books, don't buy it, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I did that. Then I, uh, I've got, I formatted it really well that it's easy to scan through it, a lot of empty spaces between the books. I added the images of every single book, and that's it. Basically, I posted it, I shared it uh, online, but I went a step further than what most people do. I went to uh, Facebook entrepreneur groups that I'm a member of, and I posted the link to my blog. Now, as opposed to a lot of people who just spam the crap out of those groups, I hate it. I hate when people do that, and I would hate doing it. Yeah. So I I wrote a description. It's like, I know a lot of you guys are reading books and often you ask which kind of book uh, you should read. So there you go. Here's a list that I made of the books that I personally read and I highly recommend. Check it out. And I think this was the most shared post that I ever uh, created on my blog. Um, the traffic that, well, on this specific day when I posted it, I think my traffic grew by 500% than it, you know what I usually have. And uh, anyway, so this is a, a little example in many, many words. I just explained a little example of how you know, creating proper content is a great idea, but it's not just about the content itself. You have to promote it. Um, you have to get out there and tell people about this content and put it in front of the others. Like you mentioned, uh, Product Hunt is a, is a great place to uh, promote your stuff. I've never tried it. I know very well what it is, but I've never used it yet. Um, but yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a good strategy. I mean, I, I challenge anyone listening to, um, you know, look at the the top three results in Google for, for anything that, uh, you know, you're you're an expert in or, or that you, you know stuff about um, and really say to yourself, you know, can I write something that's 10 times better than this? And if you can, um, it's a really good strategy when it comes to content. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think if you write 10 times better than any other article in the top uh, results of Google, first of all, you do actually get a chance of ranking this content. And second of all, as what you did, it's you're getting... Um, you're growing your chance of people sharing that content because it's not, that's the thing. What also a lot of, a lot of beginners make the mistake that they make is they're right for Google and they're like, I just want it ranked. It's not going to rank because you tried some, some techniques, uh, you know, that, that you think Google will like, you have to make sure that your reader will totally love your content or, you know, the value you have to give them value, which you did with, with providing, uh, you know, that functionality, let's say, of stock snap. When people see the value and they love that value, this is when they will share, this is when they will talk about it. And, you know, as a byproduct, it will help your rankings as well. Yeah, definitely. All right, Christopher. So what do you think, uh, well, at this point, is the future of Snappa? Because I'm sure that you guys are constantly working on improving it, adding new features. Um, What are you working on right now? So, uh, so what's funny when, when I first, so 
All right, let me backtrack. So when we were when we first had the idea to build Snappa, um, I thought that it was all these marketers were going to love this tool, and we were going to build all these social integrations, and we we're going to integrate with WordPress and Unbounce and all these other marketing tools, and it was it was just going to be amazing. Um, so what I found after launching it was that like 80% of our user base is small business owners or freelancers or solopreneurs um, and maybe about 20% marketers. And mm-hmm. um, when I when I would get on, on Skype with them or email them and ask, you know, what they loved about Snappa, they, they, every single person said it's easy to use. Mm-hmm. So originally, you know, we kind of thought like we had to add all these features and we had to do all this stuff. Um, And don't get me wrong, we're definitely going to keep improving it and making it better. But what I realized was that above anything else, what what people love most about Snappa is that it's easy to use. Um, So going forward, we're going to be very careful of when we add features, not to overcomplicate it and turn it into a beast and and turn it into another Photoshop. Um, mm-hmm. So in terms of the future, there there's basically just you know there's a lot of features that we want to add, but again, it's just going to be you know for example, like an, we don't have an undo button right now. Uh, you know we want to add. Uh, right now, if you if you create a lot of uh, images, uh, being able to search and categorize them better. Um, having a feature where it will detect how much text there is for Facebook ads, you know, little things like that. Um, but to be honest, we, we really do want to keep the tool extremely easy to use. We want to keep, keep it focused on, you know, small business owners and marketers, and we're not going to try to turn it into, you know, a Photoshop that's just on the web. (laughs) So that, that's kind of uh, the direction we're going in. Yeah, totally. That makes a lot of sense. And this is really smart, I think, because for me personally, there's nothing more that I hate than uh, signing up for a service or, or a software of some sort and being totally lost because it just has so many things or, you know, if they're organized in a really bad way. And I'll give you an example. One of the worst user interfaces that I used is uh, Amazon uh, Seller. Right. If you log into that, you're, you'll be, it's not that you'll be just lost, you'll be lost for months to come <laughs> because it's so poorly built. And I mean, it works fine most of the time. It's just the way they built it. You know, it's really the user interaction uh, and the user experience. You have no idea what you're clicking and they're using all these like words that, that you've never heard before. And you're like, what really, this is, this is that. So, you know, I kind of don't have a choice as to use them if I want to sell on Amazon. But if there was an alternative, I would totally leave them and use something else. And as you're saying with Snappa, that's the thing. If it's really easy to use and if customers compliment you on that, then it's a really, really good idea to not complicate things for nothing and keep it as simple as possible. Because chances are this is why your uh, users are you know, still are your users. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, I I got the privilege of talking to uh, a lot of our customers. And there's something about, you know, helping small business owners and and solopreneurs and freelancers. A lot of these people are hustling. uh, They're they're building their online business. Um, And, you know, I just, I love these kinds of customers, you know, because it's almost like we share the same struggle, so to speak. Um, and so I really like that kind of corner of the market as opposed to trying to sell to these massive companies and, and, uh, and, and that kind of stuff. So I really like where, you know, we're positioning Snappa, the kinds of customers that are buying from us. And uh, to be honest, I, I, I don't really think we need to change that. It's just going to be a matter of getting more customers and, and that's it. Mm-hmm. No, that's that's a great strategy as well, <laughs> because I know that you don't have a choice as to, um, I don't want to say improve, but you don't have a choice as to keep it updated, because you know browsers get updated, things change, and you uh, you don't have a choice as to constantly keep on working on it. That's pretty much every software they have to do that. So that's already you know a lot of work being invested there, I'm sure, and a lot of money as well. Yeah, for sure. So. I mean, we're we're basically listening to you know the customer feedback, 
um, and uh, you know they're driving a lot of uh, of the, the they they really do help us prioritize um, you know what's important and what's not, and so um, you know generally speaking. Uh, you know, if, if a bunch of people are, are requesting one thing, that that's what we're going to add, um, and we're ju- we're just going to keep improving it, and but uh, just staying true to ourselves. Yeah, that's awesome. And Christopher, in your opinion or in your experience, what has been your biggest struggle with Snappa, or should I say, Snappa's biggest struggle uh, for growing you know, growing the the business? Um, that's a good question. I mean, it's, it's been tough development wise because, um, you know, I, I have, there's basically just my co-founder who's, who's essentially building it. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not a simple tool. Let let me put it that way. Um, Mm -hmm. and we've, you know, just, just recently we, we, we started building it on one framework and, uh, you know, realizing that there's going to be limitations. So now we basically had to almost rewrite uh, the software um, and convert it to kind of like our own proprietary system. Um, And so, you know, the challenge has just been trying to balance, um, you know, building new features and also improving the existing platform. Um, there's, you know, the, every browser works differently. So you have to make sure it, you know, it works, works good in all browsers. Um, and just trying to please as many people as possible. Uh, so I'd say up to this point, it's, it's just been a challenge development wise. Um, and, uh, on the marketing side, it's, it's really just, um, you know, convergence is one thing like with a freemium model. Uh, you know, conversions are pretty low. So just trying to come up with uh, different ways where we could potentially uh, increase the conversions a bit. Um, so at the end, I tend to be the kind of guy who puts a lot of pressure on myself as well. <laughs> so, you know, I've kind of had to learn that, you know, it's it's not the end of the world if, if this gets delayed a week or, uh, you know, if this feature is not going to be ready within the next month or so. Um, and, uh, so that, that's been a bit of a challenge as well, but, uh, we're, we're working on that. Mm-hmm. Thank, thanks for sharing that, Christopher. Yeah. I mean, I, I would just say like, especially with software, um, nothing is going to go as planned. So, uh, you're just going to have to be ready to accept the fact that, you know, there's going to be delays, there's going to be bugs, uh, shit's going to hit the fan at some point and you just need to be prepared for that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's uh, yeah, that's something that I hear often enough, not just about software, but about software as well and about websites. When people, um, let's say people launch a new product and it really picks up really fast and they didn't expect that many people, let's say, going to their website or downloading the software and everything they have online just crashes, goes down. And, you know, you start talking with your hosting company, but they cannot do anything. And it takes you three days to get your website back up. And you like missing out on thousands and thousands of people. They're trying to buy your stuff. Yeah. Uh, every time I hear the story, I'm like, oh, my God, this is this is like biggest nightmare. Yeah, I, I will say this, though. We we launched our, our beta in July. Um, and we when we first launched Snappa, there is there is no templates you couldn't save anything. It was extremely basic, but people were signing up and people were using. It was free at the time. Um, and then, you know, we obviously were going to turn it into a paid product or at least have a, a paid tier. Mm-hmm. And you you had the you always have that decision. Okay, when is it? When is this ready uh, to charge? And so we. We kind of built, you know, everything that we thought had to go in there. Um, but, you know, when we first launched, like, you couldn't reposition your background photo. Um, I, I, again, there's still not an undo button. We're, we're, that's really hot on the priority list. Um, you know, there was still a bunch of features missing. And we, we went ahead and launched anyways. Um, we, we got paying customers. We're still adding paying customers every day. So... As much as there's, you know, the the delays and and the um, the unforeseen stuff, I really do feel like it's better to launch when you're almost not ready 
than it is to wait a year and have a perfect product and not even know whether people are going to buy it. Uh, it, it it's, it's a much better problem to have when you know, you kind of keep, can't keep up with demand um, than it is to not have any demand and having a perfect product. So, Yeah, I totally agree with you. This is great advice. And it doesn't just go for software. I always tell people who want to start a website or blog or YouTube channel or anything of that sort, just like pure content, right, that doesn't cost them money. I, I always tell them just launch it and then make it better. Just put it out there and then you could figure out how you can improve it. Because as you just mentioned, it's a lot... Um, not not being to supply enough, it's a lot of a better problem to have than spend a year, two years developing something and then figuring figuring out that people either don't want it or they were expecting something totally different and now they're disappointed with your product. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, if you look at you know someone like Brian Dean from Backlinko or Brian Harris from Video Fruit, uh, you know these mm-hmm. these guys are killing it with their online courses. Um, you know, they've been refining these courses every single quarter or every year or however often they release them. Um, there's no way that the course they're teaching now it w- is the same as the one they were teaching five years ago. Um, yeah. So, yeah, 100%. Not This doesn't just apply to software. It applies to absolutely everything. Just launch. Get it out there. Um, you can improve later. And to be honest, the customer is going to be your number one feedback um, so you, you want to, and a paying customer's feedback is much more valuable than a non-paying customer's feedback. So you, uh, so, so the quicker you launch, you, the quicker, um, you know, you can get their credit cards out, the better, the better off you'll be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And just recently I was reading, uh, I'm not sure, I don't remember what exactly I was reading, but the conversation was about customers giving advice to a company on how to run their business or either how to you know run run their software and that is something that i want to tell people they should really also pay attention to and be careful with advice that they take because as you just mentioned you know advice from your paid customers versus advice from your free customers will be really different and what i have seen for different well for many different businesses is that your free customers they would often um, expect a lot more from you and ask for like impossible things. I don't know why this happens, but I've seen that a lot. 100%. Uh, uh, for, whatever, <laughs> for whatever reason, a paying customer is going to expect, you know, 10% of what a, what a free customer will. That, that's just the way it goes. Um, and you bring up a good point about, you know, listening to customers. Like we had some people initially sign up who, you know, they were pretty much graphic designers. So they were, they were sending in all these feature requests of Mm -hmm. like things that our target audience would either never use or would never want to use. And so you have to be very careful of like, you know, who, what kind of people are are providing this feedback is, are they really the, the, your target, your target audience? Um, So you, you do, you you know, you want to, listen to your customers but you also want to filter out uh some of that as well yeah totally that makes a lot of sense all right christopher uh one last question for you and that's an important one what would be your biggest suggestion to any beginner entrepreneur my biggest suggestion to any entrepreneur like yeah most important thing uh i think basically what we recently just touched on was Mm -hmm. um just starting and launching something is going to be uh, the most helpful thing you can possibly do um you know like you can read all the blog posts and you listen to as many podcasts as you want but uh, the experience you'll gain from actually starting and launching uh cannot replace anything you'll read in a business book Totally. Amazing advice. And that's something to live by, I think, if you want to succeed with pretty much anything in life, not just business. 100%. All right, Christopher. So people could simply go to snapa.io to try it out, to check it out. They could go to bootstrapbay.com. Yeah, .com. 
and to stocksnap.com. Is there any other way they could find out more about you, what you do, and the businesses? Uh, just to clarify, stocksnap is .io, not uh, .com. Okay. I'll, <laughs> it's funny. I'll actually we, uh, we actually some so when we when we were trying to get the stocksnap domain, uh, the .com was taken, but at the time. Uh, it was just like a blank or it was, you know, one of those like landing pages for GoDaddy or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so we said, whatever, let's just get the .io. And so a couple months after we launch, uh, I just happened to notice that StockSnap essentially tried to copy us. <laughs> and so, wow. yeah, so definitely don't go to StockSnap.com because their website is very shady and very crappy. Uh, so I, that, I just wanted to clarify that. Uh <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of where they can reach us, yeah. So you, you uh, linked out to all the all all, all our domains, um, and if you want to hit me up on Twitter, my handle is C Gimmer C G I M M E R. Okay, awesome. Well, Christopher, thank you so much for coming on to today's show. Thank you for sharing your experience, your tips, and your suggestions to entrepreneurs. Thank you for being on the show. Pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Extra Paycheck Podcast. As usual, I will be putting up show notes page at extrapodcast.com slash 60, where you will be able to find resources, links, and other things mentioned in today's episode. Also, head over to extrapodcast.com slash iTunes in order to subscribe to the show leave a rating and a review which will help me tremendously thank you so much once again and i'll talk to you next monday